Uh, before I start my talk, actually, just let me mention, Charles Stein was my hero for the last five decades. And that, of course, is a reflection on my age also. <laughs> and uh, I began, which Professor Sigmund yesterday alluded to, I was making my living by working on fixed with confidence intervals <laughs> for many, many years. You are aware of it. <laughs> uh, in the 70s. And then also, actually, uh, I mentioned something about uh, one thing which I add to Professor Sigmund. Uh, it is the variance estimation. Stein has a very fantastic paper in Annals of the Institute of Statistical Mathematics where he said, found out, actually showed that if actually you don't have, uh, you're talking about a normal distribution, unknown mean. That is the thing, and you are trying to estimate the variance, and you take the best equivalent estimate. The denominator is degrees of freedom plus 2, summation xi minus x bar square over n plus 1. But what it showed, that if you test essentially what it amounts to, if you test mu equal to 0 and the hypothesis is true, then you will take summation xi square over n plus 2. If not, you will take summation xi minus x bar square over n plus 1, and you take actually based on the minimum of the two, depending on how your test is there, you get a better estimate than the best equivariant estimate. And I generalized it. Jim Zedak jumped quite a bit of stuff on that, that eventually I got a smooth version of it, but that was also in the 90s. Uh, then, of course, uh, this particular area, the inadmissibility is much more recent, uh, not recent, the particular thing I'm talking about is of a recent origin, but I first got into it. I knew Stein's result. I used to prove it in my inference course. But that is based on his uh, 1961 paper. That result I was giving, although I had a different proof. I thought once I would write the proof. And to my dismay, I found that Baranchik already knew that proof. And he used it in his annals paper. So that was it. But in late 70s, there was a student, actually, who wanted to work on Stein estimation. And that's the first time I got into it. And ever since, I've actually moved into this area back and forth. So for quite some time, between uh, late 70s to even possible late 80s, I was working on this kind of stuff. Then there was a fallow period. And what happened, actually, after that, it is only in 2005 or 6 when I saw that landmark. I was introduced to the landmark paper of Professor Kumaki, followed by the work of Ed George and others. That was another outstanding, two outstanding papers. And then there was a student. I asked, I found out that they were working with Kulbeck libel laws, and I found it was very easily I could realize it was a special case of what people call alpha divergence, although my notations will call it beta divergence, but that's all right which was originally introduced by René as early as 1962. And again, somehow or other, most people don't recognize it was done by René, and later by Amory also in the 80s. It goes by the name of Cressy Reed for some reason. Believe me or not, I don't know how many people here, when I introduce the last, I can ask again. Cressy and Reed, but it was really René in his Berkeley Symposium, 1961. So we got some results, and then again, only recently, a couple of years ago, we got into it again, and Professor Kubokawa from the University of Tokyo was visiting me. We'd write a whole bunch of papers that time, five or six. I tried to include one of those. That is the most recent, but otherwise, it will be mostly a review talk. If time permits, I will at least give one of the results which I have got with Dr. Kubokawa. So let's move. So I'll give an introduction where I will basically give actually the results which I'm going to describe, almost everything, which, which will be coming in later sections. Start with squared-riddle loss, uh, just to introduce. And then the divergence loss I will, uh, I will get. Prove the inadmissibility results. Stein's harmonic prior, that, which will be again later in the afternoon, uh, will be presented in a more general form. I will talk a little bit more about it. A two-sample problem is the one with Professor Kubokova, if time permits, and I'll make some final remarks. And one of the things I will try to point out, not just necessarily my work, 
that the work of also Professor Kamaki, Professor George, and others, the duality between estimation and prediction. So that's the plan. So let's start. So just the history, the natural estimator, of course, is the sample mean, UMV, MLE, best equivalent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The minimax under a very general kind of loss, not quite the loss I will be talking about, but something like, let's see if I can open this thing. Ah. Which one is better, black or green? Yeah, got it, the black one. Symmetric, bowl shape loss, that kind of thing. Uh, it was actually first addressed in the PhD dissertation of Colin Blythe under Lehman. And the minimaxity was proved, pro and Blythe proved that visibility. For the normal case, for a general class of losses, which I just pointed out, including but not limited to square root loss. And Stein, of course, as we all know, 1956 made the surprising discovery. In one of two dimensions, it is admissible. In three or higher, it is not, but just under square root loss. Now, this will be relevant for me. The paper by Alvin Beranchik, who passed away, unfortunately, a few years ago, I presume, uh, under square root loss provided a very general class of minimax estimators. I will be using that even for prediction, uh, including the James Stein estimator, which dominates the sample means in three or higher dimension under square root loss. And a very important subclass, of course, I'm not going to talk about that, based minimax estimator and the hierarchical priors, the Stroderman, and of course there is Ephraim and Morris who provided an empirical based interpretation and then the thing got popular. That was in the early 70s and the thing got quite popular and there was a flurry of activities because for the first about 10 years there was hardly anything other than Stein students who were working on it. But then after Ephraim Morris' this paper, and extending that idea as far that, of course, even the Beranchik class of estimators can be given empirical based interpretation in general. The important thing is, James Stein estimator of the variance which dominate the sample mean continue to do so when it comes to prediction of the future observation for a normal distribution with the same mean and the square or loss. Now, I'm talking about square error first, not kullback labler yet. This is consequence of a more general result which establishes duality between estimation prediction and square error. That's an obvious thing as I will show very quickly. Now question is, Robert, Christian Robert in his award-winning text points out that often it is natural to use losses, unfortunately there is a typo, which compare directly the densities, f of x given, I should have written theta here, not x, and f of a, if a theta is the true parameter, and he calls such losses intrinsic losses. He said we should not use uh, actually the squared error or anything like that. You should compare two densities, and possibly the most important one is the kullback leibler although Hellinger is a very strong competitor. The two most well-used divergence measures between densities of the kullback leibler of the entropy distance, and the Bhattacharya Hellinger, I call it Bhattacharya also, there is a paper which I was not even aware that my former teacher, undergraduate teacher Anil Bhattacharya, better known for Bhattacharya bounds actually, and Professor Bhattacharya had this divergence thing without of course being aware of the work of Hellinger, of course it goes by the name of Hellinger, he did exactly that loss actually as a distance, divergence measure. In his 43 paper in the Calcutta Mathematical Station Bulletin, something like that, that's why. And how did I find it? There is a Russian author, Shibishov, who recognized that it was also done by Vatacharya. And while I was reading his stuff, I found out that my teacher was also involved. It's not just Hellinger. Quite interesting. However, if x is normal, theta vx norm times identity, now this time, no typo, the kullback leibler distance is just equivalent to square root. So there is not much point estimation based on kullback leibler is tent about to square root loss for known Vx. So it is exactly the same. Any questions this far? 
Still history, <laughs> and more history. <laughs> All right? So there is not much. Now, kullback leibler a special cases of a more general, this is what René is the one, 19, Amory, Cressy, Reed. Somehow or other, it is Stigler's law. It goes by the name of Cressy and Reed, right? Stigler's law says it is <laughs> not the person who first did it. It is someone else who got it. Now, it can be interpreted as limit. Beta tending to zero or beta tending to one. Beta tending to zero gives the kullback leibler and beta tending to one gives the other side of kullback leibler And of course, if beta is half, you can write four times. Uh, I can point it out, this thing. And it is just a matter of simplifying it. Look at it. If you square it, you get a, an integrate one, another one. So it gets that four minus integral of the product. So it is just the distance between the square root of the two densities. It is popular with some people, but not as much as Kullback Leibler as I would guess. Now recently, I'm again coming back to the work of Professor Kumaki, and then a George, his student, and of course Fang Liang, they considered improved minimax predictive densities under the Kullback Leibler laws. So they have de developed various shrinkage version of predictive densities. I will talk about it, which dominate the base predictive density with the uniform prior. Why the uniform prior? I will come to that also for a future observation, conditionally independent of the sample observations. And George et al. also explored various interesting duality results between multivariate estimation and prediction in the normal problem under the kullback leibler the KL loss. And my understanding is Yazoo has got it now under the general divergence loss, but that you have to wait on for that until Friday. In contrast, my student, Go, uh, Victor Margale and Gauri Data, we con considered the general divergence loss, again established duality between estimation and prediction in a different way. I will show you that, and showed that the general Baranchik class of estimators continue to dominate the sample mean when it comes to prediction centered at that Baranchik estimator. Also, the EB interpretation, of course, continues to hold under this general laws. And the key feature of my talk will be explored the duality estimation and prediction under the general divergence laws. So that's the background. Is it okay so far? All right. Next. So start with the known results. Uh, for some people in this room, all the slides are all familiar, so I, I have nothing extra adding, but let us see. So squared error loss, the classical result of Stein, James Stein. So x and theta, normal, mean theta, and then squared error loss, and this is the, uh, actually the James Stein estimator, which dominates, actually, the x and the squared error loss. Now, Baranchik's general result is, Instead of putting this constant, you can, this x, norm x squared I'm calling s, you can put a tau s here, which dominates x. Tau s is non-decreasing in s, and 0 less than tau s less than 2 times p minus 2. So special case is p minus 2, but it has some optimality. If tau s is equal to a constant, the optimal is p minus 2. Although the result holds between 0 to 2 times p minus 2, the optimal one is p minus 2, which gives the James Stein estimate. That's, but it comes from uh, also uh, Baranchik's general result. The general Baranchik class of inter uh, interpretation, I'm just writing a very simple way. x is normal. This is known. This a is unknown. I mean, the variance ratio that is unknown. Uh, I can put an i here, uh, the vx equal to 1, vx equal to 1, then again back to Efron Morris's framework. But, and then the Bayes estimator under squared rule loss is just 1 minus b times x. b is, this is just a little bit of calculus, 1 plus a inverse. To estimate b, that is the empirical base. I'm assuming the prior parameter is unknown, estimate it from the data. So what you have to do, you have to marginalize. Now, what happens? If it marginalizes, the mean becomes 0, and variance becomes a plus 1, which is b inverse vx times ip. That's what it is. Now, what is complete sufficient based on this marginal? Marginal means I'm integrating out theta. 
all right? So general class of EB estimators is of that form, B hat S, and marginally S is B inverse chi P square. The UMV is P minus two by S, but this whole general balance sheet class can be put in this particular form, but it could be even more general. So resulting EB estimator is actually the James Stein uh, for the specific case if you use the UMV V of B. You can use MLE and others, but again, the optimal constant is that P minus two. Okay, old story, but still. An important class of Bayes estimators, that is what I will talk about a little bit later, also is provided in Stein's 1981 paper. We talked uh, yesterday, it was mentioned. Uh, you take a general prior, and then the marginal is, this phi stands for the normal, mean theta, variance Vx Ip, and phi theta is the prior, and then if you integrate out theta, that's the marginal, the Bayes estimator is given by this. Uh, that's not Stein's results, it's called Tweedy's formula, if I recall correctly, it is Tweedy, I think. But delta denotes the gradient vector, and Stein showed if either m pi or m pi half, this thing, is superharmonic, that means negative Laplacian, sum of the second derivatives, actually, del two and pi x del xi square is less than zero, or actually m pi half also, either m pi or m pi half is superharmonic with a negative Laplacian, then delta pi x dominates x. It will be quite interesting, because this is the fact which has been utilized also by George et al. Now Stein proposed, of course, the harmonic prior, which is of that form. So that's the same thing. Instead of superharmonic, you have harmonic, and you have that delta pi x is still dominating x. So that is Stein's prior, as some people call it. It is a very, very popular one. Now duality between dominance square real loss, it is a triviality. Of x, uh, x of theta predicted x of y, where x is orthogonal to y given theta with mean theta, it is trivial. Look at ex of theta, which dominates x and the square rule loss. Then expectation of ex minus y square, I just subtract theta. They are independent, so it turns out to be this, and this is dominating x, so it is less than this. Retrace the steps, it is x minus y square. Conversely, if this happens, subtract E of y minus theta, you get that. So for square rule loss, the duality between estimation and prediction is very, very simple. It is much more challenging under kullback level loss or the general divergence kind of loss we shall be talking about. So now let us go to divergence loss, as I was talking. X is orthogonal to Y given theta with corresponding PDFs. Most people write alpha here, and I, I, most people write it slightly differently. I like to write it in this way, but that's just my taste. Nothing special about it. Pi theta X is the posterior PDF of theta given X, and this predictive density of Y is proportional to this K times. Uh, this power is one over one minus beta. Okay, um, this is just integrating out so that I normalize it. And what is kyx? p to the power one minus beta y theta pi theta x. For kullback liable loss, what happens? Beta tends to zero. It is the usual predictive density, which Atchison possibly talked about more than about 45 years ago, 1975 paper of Atchison. That's a classical paper again. So kullback liable is just a special case. So keep in mind, it is proportional to this thing, and you have this power. All right. Now, let me digress a little bit. And this I learned only very recently, believe me or not, because when I was evaluating all these integrals under these laws, uh, my, this general divergence laws, I was doing square completion. And I wrote a paper with Dr. Kuboko about it, and there was a referee who pointed out a very nice thing. The referee may be present here. If he's here, you don't have technology right now, but you can tell me in private <laughs> that what it is. The result is very interesting. Z1, and particularly for normal, multivariate normal. Two independent p-component random vectors. 
It is a digression, a very general result. Density is f1 and f2, distribution functions f1 and f2. So I'm interested in z1 minus z2, this, uh, here it is z, z1 minus f2. So h and h are the PDF and distribution. Then h of zero is that integral. And why it is useful for us, I will immediately tell you. The proof is trivial. Look at h of x, it is given by this, just differentiating both sides, the usual convolution formula with respect to x, you get h of x like this, put zero, it is f1 z, f2 z. Now in particular, if you have two normals, uh, it is the normal zero evaluated mu one minus mu two, sigma one plus sigma two. This is not quite right, it should be proportional to, I forgot the constant, writing the constant. In particular, what happens? L beta theta A, if you use that, if you go back actually a little bit here, as soon as I have this f of one minus beta, f of beta and two normal, I can immediately convert it to two normal but just by changing the variance. So it is two normal distributions with certain variances, right? Take the uh, difference of that. So when I evaluate the integral, as I said, what I used to do, I used to do square completion kind of thing thing for a long time. And this guy he immediately pointed out, and from now on, my life has become very easy, believe me or not. All right. <laughs> so just use that, you get that result. So this will become another normal, right? If it is power that changing the variance, that's it. So now, if you go to the next page, it becomes, uh, I said, not quite correct. I forgot the constant, but it is proportional to just this thing. There's the easiest way to prove the result, using that result. <laughs> if not anything else, you will learn a new technique, possibly, <laughs> from this particular result. And I learned it, and ever since, I'm using it. <laughs> Only a couple of years ago. So consider now why an x are orthogonal, given theta, y is this, x is this distribution, theta has this prior, B is just Vx over, but now goal is here to maximize. Why maximize? If you go back two slides earlier, it is one minus, and that's why instead of minimizing that, the whole thing, it is maximizing. Beta is between zero and one, it is maximizing this particular integral. And again, I apply that. This time I'm careful. It's proportional to just this thing. And this is maximized when A is that particular. So Bayes' estimator comes out in a flash using that result, okay? <laughs> Go for prediction, then there is a one over, I wrote it because I could not quite fit it, the one over one minus beta on the right hand side. That's why I write it. Use the same result. It turns out like this. And then if you take out this one over one minus beta, you get the predictive density given by this. It is Vx times one minus V, one minus beta plus Vy, the variance, and the mean is still one minus Vx plus V mu, as I showed you earlier. So particular case, pi theta equal to one, B goes to zero, the kullback leibler then the base predictive density of Y is, which Professor Kumaki, Ed George, others, they have all used it, and this is the density under the uniform prior. And the plug-in density is just, of course, x, and instead of this particular variance, put v of y. But why not the plug-in density? That's the main thing. That's a crowded uh, page, but we'll see that. Estimating the norm, the mean, the base estimator under the prior is x for the general divergence laws as well as square error laws. So pi theta is one, that's the common feature. Similarly, under the divergence law, the base predictive density under the prior pi theta equal to one, actually, uh, uh, the PU actually. Di not divergence, just the kullback lambda specifically, not the general. Uh, is the prior is this density, x instead of just Vx IP, Vx plus Vy IP. So this thing has smaller risk, that of the plugging predictor, this, this can be shown very directly. Again, you can use 
the results which I'm talking about. Now, now the duality. X is a minimax estimator of theta under the general divergence laws in any arbitrary dimension. Similarly, this under the uniform prior, this base predictor which I've given here is a minimax predictor under the laws. I'm writing general divergence laws. I'm talking about kullback liabler here, really. Anyway, uh, it's true under general divergence laws also. I'm not, I'm using the word, but I'm not putting the one minus beta. I'm putting beta equal to zero. While time type shrinkage estimators are targeted to dominate x, the goal is to improve on PU hat y x slash shrinkage. And this is what one wants to accomplish under the general divergence laws. That is, so in the terminal of Ed George, this is the straw man. While for estimation, the straw man is x. Here it is, this particular predictive, the plug-in, not the plug-in, the p u hat, this density, which you would like to dominate. <laughs> now, there are some interesting things what we proved. This is general divergence loss for p equal to 1. Now, we could not quite prove it for p equal to 2. Uh, it may be solved by now. Can anyone update me on this? If not, Yazoo, this is your homework this evening, and by Friday, you'll get the false result. The admissibility will be there. He can prove it in one in the evening. OK, here is a problem for you, OK? But it is an admissible. We proved that for p greater than or equal to 3. And the duality is this kind of thing. What we did, the Baranchik class of estimators, we wrote it that. So when it comes to predictive density, this is the work of Victor, myself, and Gauri. We took the delta tau x as the mean and kept the variance sense. And now I have put 1 minus beta. It is the general divergence, actually, variance. And this is what it is. And now what we proved. A very crowded page, but this is a very important thing. Look at this. For estimation problem, this is given by this. For the prediction problem, again, this is the general. This is the expression for the loss. For the prediction problem, this is this very complicated thing. And you have to, the derivation is far from obvious. And I'm not even getting into it. Now, for p greater than or equal to 3, this is the theorem by Victor, myself, and Gauri. If tau t, just like Baranchik, less than 2 times p minus 2, tau t is a differentiable. Uh, this is not quite needed, but non-decreasing is important. Could be a constant. Then r theta delta tau x is less than r theta x under this general loss now, not just squared error. Baranchik proved it under squared error. And then for prediction, you have a similar result. This is our general prediction result, r theta y vyip, and this one is less than this particular. The difficulty is not getting the expression. Now with this tool, h0, you can get the expression, but then proving the dominance is a real, you have to <laughs> actually do a lot of hard work. That's what it is. The above result, now there are some extensions which I will talk about. Immediately extended to shrink it towards an arbitrary regression surface. This is all coming from our old paper with Victor and Gauri. Suppose x is this particular distribution. Theta has this regression distribution surface. K is a known p by r matrix of rank r. And I take the projection matrix p and the residual matrix r star, residual, sorry, residual r star scalar. P greater than or equal to r plus 3, tau t is this. No, this is not right. It should be 2 times p minus r minus 2. Sorry, another typo, p minus r minus 2. Differentiable non-decreasing function. We can dominate it under the general divergence law. Similar dominance result for the prediction. There are, this is all from that paper with Margil and that. But then, there are a couple of interesting things which also are in Victor's thesis. Consider now the case, but both Vx and theta are unknown. 
And for squadral loss, this was addressed in a paper of Efren and Morris, 1976, Annals of Statistics. And S is distributed as S over Vx is chi m square. You can see that the calculations become much simpler if you put uh, degrees of freedom plus two, the best equivariant estimator as I was trying to talk, talk about for the variance rather than uh, uh, N or whatever. So this is the balanced one on N over mod. X is the vector of treatment means, S is the multiple of the air mean square. The goal continues to be estimation of theta under the general divergence loss, as I'm saying, but then X minus theta square over Vx is chi p square. The risk of X is given by that. These are all ex basic extensions. And following Baranchik and Efron and Morris, we consider this rival set of estimators, and the loss is just like before. Then again, you have p greater than or equal to 3. There is no regression here. So 2 times p minus 2 for all t positive. And tau t, so exactly Baranchik type estimation results, actually. We still don't have the prediction result here for the unknown v case. It is only estimation. There is a second paper also in the Journal of Multivariate Analysis, only Victor and myself, where he got all these estimation results. There could be prediction results also, all these unknown <coughs> cases. So another potential problem to solve. So finally, let's G1, Z2, Zn be normal mid theta sigma. Both theta and sigma are known. X is Z bar. S is the Wishart matrix. The divergence loss, now again, you can simplify very simple, and using the fact that this thing is a chi-square, you can compute the risk of x, and you have the dominance result, again, with this general class of estimator, quite in the spirit of Stein and Baranchik. This is the loss, p greater than or equal to 3. This is the bound. This is correct. It is not quite 2 times p minus 2, but this is n minus p plus 2. The tau t is non-decreasing you get this dominance result. These are all there. Now I will pick back into, not my work, but the work which Professor Kumaki and Ed George and others did, just give you that uh, result. Stein's harmonic prior, dominating x when x is this. Uh, I think you were the first one, right, who developed it. So I will give you the credit, <laughs> unless you, <laughs> you were the first one who first developed Stein interpret for the density under this particular setup, kullback lab loss. Predictive density under Stein's harmonic classical based as developed by Atchison under the, the straw man of Ed George under the kullback lab loss. Then George, Liang, and Zhu followed this work, the dominance under general superharmonic priors, and the duality between estimation and prediction under the superharmonic priors. And I'm giving their result now. Some details. Y is orthogonal to X given theta, the same distributions. You take the posterior prediction for an arbitrary prior pi. Uniform is the one I will be taking. M pi is a generic notation for marginals. You take this W. This is the, their first step. And this is the posterior predictive distribution of Y given X under the uniform prior. The first result is a basic identity. For any arbitrary prior, okay, the predictive density of y given x, you can write it as the ratio where the variance is vw, actually with the w is this thing, m pi x vx multiplied by the one under the uniform prior. This is a very beautiful result. The second result is also known if pi theta is superharmonic, then m pi is superharmonic, or equivalently m pi to the power of half is superharmonic. It is just a matter of integration by parcel twice, and you can get that result. Very simple. I give it as an exercise to my students, and they always get it right. <laughs> and result three is a very critical one. That is a George. Look at the kullback level loss, the predictive density under the uniform prior, with an arbitrary prior, you have this particular identity. So now, it is the base estimator of theta under the prior pi theta. So that's the dominant property of base point estimator of theta under square root of loss. 
is inherited by beta's predictive density under the kullback level laws. So stand short, pi theta is superharmonic, delta pi x dominates x under square a loss. Result three, same dominance result holds under kullback level laws. Beautiful, beautiful result of George et al. I love it. <laughs> uh, there is still time, five minutes or so. Let me try my recent stuff and let me try to say something here. Simultaneous estimation of two population means when one suspects the two means to be nearly equal. Uh, like, uh, I don't like preliminary test estimator. I like smooth version of it. So I do not, whenever there is a PTA, I will go for an empirical based type result, really. So rather than estimating the two means separately, more profitable to shrink each means towards a pool beam. An EB approach handles this in an adaptive way rather than a preliminary test approach. Nimal Sinha and myself, 1988, I think maybe Bill Stroderman also did it. Uh, neither one of them was scooped up, actually, uh, published in, we published in possibly multivariate, then he published somewhere, I don't know. Hierarchical empirical dominating individual sample means under square or laws, and the same phenomenon holds under the general. Day. That thing is a very recent thing, which I proved with Dr. Kubokov. It holds the same thing. <laughs> And just to get the result, uh, x1, x2, they're mutually independent. S is chi squared, and also the variance doesn't have to be known. But you take, this is the notation for the joint PDF, and this is the divergent, general version of the divergence loss. I take G priors, that means the variance, uh, actually, it is just a, the prior variance is just a multiple of the sampling variance, Zellner. Used it. So HD estimators are given by this particular result, but new hat is this particular thing. Okay, these are still, uh, and this is the result. And what we got was first estimate B for known sigma square, because marginal x1 minus x2 has this distribution. And this thing is therefore given as a B inverse chi B square. Expectation of that have used even for FM modis use B greater than or equal to three. So use this estimate for B hat, estimate sigma square hat by S over N plus two, and define the F statistic. Quite in the spirit of Ephraim and Morris. The only thing is, loss is no longer squared error. It was squared error at the time I worked with Bimo, but not anymore. So consider the shrinkage estimator just like this. And the theorem is, if mu1 hat pi dominates x1 under the general divergence laws, this is the estimate. Now, instead of, because the variance is unknown, you have the f statistic. And this is the phi, then the basic, tick, then you have this dominance result. Again, for estimation. The basic technique for proving is to introduce this w again and exploit the independence of w is c equal to x1 minus x2. Get to my final slide. Stein's 1950s was a major breakthrough in statistics. Impact is felt even today. I'm so interested to see Stein thing in for machine learning. I'll start learning it. I do some machine learning work with my students, and maybe <laughs> we can do more <laughs> with Stein. Uh, Stein's original result, a continuously used theory and application of statistics. The Stein phenomenon for prediction is of more recent origin, and we have focused on for both estimation prediction and point out the duality in several contexts. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your invitation. And it was a pleasure visiting Singapore again. It's always nice. The facilities are great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, Ian. Not quite, uh, only in the Kullback Library. I want it for the general. The Kullback Library is known, yeah. So it should work even for general divergence. Have you proved it already? No. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're putting a lot of stress on him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, for Kullback Library it is. 
So for the um, the quantitative savings and risk, right? That's this dominance, right? Um, do you get the same significant savings and risk as in the James Stein? Same, same thing. So everything is the same. Stein. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so what's your intuition that this actually carries through to the divergence? Divergence is so much more complicated. Yeah, the loss is much more complicated. Right, it's much more. But the result continues to hold. That's continues all. Continues to hold. Okay. It's, it's a fun thing. <laughs> more fun than anything else. And maybe. No, actually, yeah, I know his recent paper where he has got Stein's harmonic prior for the general, that I am correct, right? For this general divergence loss, and he has got it. Okay. <laughs> Possibly the duality, I'm sure. But that is, you have to wait until Friday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are there any more questions for Malai? All right, if not, uh, we'll break for half an hour, coffee break. And the next talk will be at uh, 10.45. Very good. By Larry. Uh, yeah. He's, he's around, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. And let's thank Malai again for his very nice thank talk. You.